My name is Taika Noki, and I am the Senior Vice Rector of the United Nations University. Tonight, at our virtual conversation series, we have Mr. Robin Lewis, who is the co-founder of MyMizu, the first water refill app in Japan. As you know, today is the World Water Day, and Robin and I are here to discuss a variety of issues surrounding water, since I'm also a hydrologist. So Robin, would you please tell us about yourself briefly? Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and uh, happy World Water Day. Uh, okay. My name is Robin uh, Takashi Lewis and uh, I'm half Japanese and half English. Uh, so I was born here in Japan, but grew up mainly uh, abroad. Um, and currently I'm focusing on an initiative called My Mizu, uh, okay. which is all about uh, water and promoting sustainable consumption, uh, which is a, a topic for today, the, the big day of, of World Water Day. Oh, thank you. Yes, but would you please introduce about My Mizu more in detail, Robin? Sure, so My Mizu is uh, an, an initiative to uh, connect people with water. It's a very, very simple concept, um, but we connect people all over the world with about 200,000 uh, locations where you can uh, refill your reusable water bottle uh, instead of buying plastic bottles. Uh, so the idea is to shift people away from um, harmful, sustainable, uh, harmful consumption practices like buying plastic bottles and really valuing water um, wherever they go. Um, so it's an initiative uh, to connect people, but also to have a conversation around water and through that to change a society in a positive way. I see. So but we, you see that my means that can we download the app for our smartphones? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a free uh, smartphone application and you can download it um, and you can use it uh, anywhere in the world. Um, right now, we're mainly focused on Japan. Uh, uh -huh. So if you uh, use the MyMizu platform, uh, you can find about 8,000 locations around Japan where you can uh, take your water bottle and refill it completely for free. Well, but you said that 20,000 whole location, right? So that yeah. outside of Japan still you have 12,000 locations in the MyMizu app. Actually, we have two two hundred thousand. So oh, you said two hundred. <laughs> sorry, wow. But what's what's I'm really un so unique well. about this is uh, we don't, you know, map all of the points and provide it as a service. We rely on crowdsourcing. So we have people all over the world adding information about water points uh, in Japan, in Australia, in the U.S. And so it's kind of a community effort to map out all over the world's uh, drinkable water, and through that eliminate the need for a bottled water. I see. What are the incentives of these people, voluntary people to contribute to, for these MyMiz activities? That's a really great uh, question. And I think honestly, people want to engage in something, right? Mm -hmm. if, if it's just a service that we provide, I think it's very transactional. Here you go, please enjoy. Whereas if it's taking part, I think it's a much more enjoyable process. And I think ultimately people want to make something and build something uh, with other people. So as my music, we always say, it's not just about the technology. The technology is important, but actually what is the most important is having the people to make things work and to drive the change. So we always combine the technology component with this community component as well. How the my music can change our world for the better place. You know, I, I guess over the past um, 10 years, I've been uh, lucky enough to, to work in um, sustainable development and, and uh, climate change and so on. And it's often uh, very difficult to have conversations with people about CO2 emissions, about sea level rise and, and so on, because it's, it's quite a complex issue. And, you know, honestly, not even, you know, I don't understand all of these things happening. Um, and, but if you boil it down to very simple things, um, everyone understands what a plastic bottle is, and it becomes the, the kind of entry point to a wider shift in behavior. So I, we always say that the, the plastic bottle is step one of a much, much bigger transition 
that can lead to you know a more sustainable way of living. When did you start the My Miss activities? Uh, it's actually relatively recently. Uh -huh. uh, we launched the My Miss service in 2019. Okay. Um, and since then, it's been a very crazy journey. <laughs> Was it? Yeah. Is it emerging rapidly? Um, you know, I. I think we're very lucky in that we have many partners, you know, schools, universities, companies, uh, local governments who want to take part in what we're doing. Because, again, it's all about co-creation, about building things together. Um, so we, we rely extremely heavily on these partnerships. And so recently we've been working with schools doing um, these reusable bottle design contests. We've been uh, doing lots of challenges with universities. Um, and we've been doing lots of creative um, campaigns with companies as well to try and uh, get everyone to, to care about water and to shift their behavior as well. I see. But I wonder, you may have some criticism from the beverage companies for selling their plastic bottles <laughs> with water or there's some tea or the juice, don't you? <laughs> uh, definitely, you know, we, there are some challenges there, but what I would say is it's, it's really fascinating talking to people about water, let's say 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, because 30 years ago, it wasn't really common to buy water. It's in Japan anyway, right? It, it was something that was accessible to everyone. It's everyone's, um, you know, right to access the water. But now uh, most, a lot of people buy bottled water and, and uh, private uh, privatized water, right? And so this whole shift that's happened over the past three or four decades has had uh, in many ways a negative impact on the environment. So, you know, my personal philosophy is um, not to make enemies with the beverage companies, but we also have to stand up for what's right and we have to speak the truth. Um, but we are also, uh, you know, having many discussions with beverage companies about how we can help them to shift away. Because if a big company uh, let's say beverage company A starts to shift away from um, plastic packaging and, and become more sustainable, that can have a huge impact on the entire um, society. So we've been working a lot with beverage companies to try and help them make that transition even quicker. I see. But do you think, I, I'm not a specialist neither about the, do you think that, the, for example, they switch from the plastic bottle to the paper can, I mean, uh, a pack or something could save the earth or may not? I mean, this is a thing. There's always negative impacts of everything, right? And so I think yeah. the, the issue with something like plastic is, is the, the longevity. You know, it's a fantastic uh, material because it's so flexible. It's so cheap. It lasts for so long. But if we lose that into the natural environment, then that has a, has a huge impact uh, on uh, marine life, but also on our physical health as well. So, you know, while there's no perfect answer, I think um, there are definitely positive things that we can do, such as shifting to paper-based or um, biodegradable products as well. Maybe the glass bottles could be the, I mean, reusable, mm. returnable. However, that they're more or less heavy and it yeah. can consume more energy to, you know, transport, so we are not sure what is the best way. Mm, ex exactly, no. And that's why I, I think that the conversation around uh, recycling is also quite important to this conversation because mm -hmm. in many ways, recycling is seen as the solution, right? And if you look at the, stat the statistics in Japan, we recycle something like 85% yeah, of single-use plastic. However, yeah. we yeah. actually burn a lot of that through a process called uh, thermal... Uh, re recycling and so there's a, a bit of a mismatch in between the everyday person's understanding and of what really happens so our solution is let's not you know recycling is okay but let's try and reduce fundamentally let's yeah. think about water let's reduce our consumption and that is probably the, the best thing that we can do right now i see so through the activities then what have you learned from that my miss or the other environmental friendly or the, the social innovation or the entrepreneurship or whatever? What I really like about water is when you think about your daily life, the first thing that you do when you wake up is you often wash your face. You may, you know, wash your hands or something. 
Um, and the moment before you go to bed, what's the last thing you do? Often you just you brush your teeth, right? And so every day you're using so much water, not just in the house, but also through the products that we buy. If you look at the, the overall kind of water footprint of, of the things that we buy. And so the power of water, I think, is that it connects, everyone's connected by water. And if we can start to change small behaviors around water, I think that can have a really, really big impact. So one of the things that we say is that water is such a powerful tool to change behavior because it's so basic, because we take it for granted. Um, and so I would say that's one thing. Um, secondly, I would say also the power of community as well. Um, whenever um, you're trying to make this kind of broad systemic change, you need to engage people in a positive conversation about what's possible. Um, it's important to say the negative things and, and speak the truth about environmental crisis and all of these things, but we also have to provide solutions and lead people uh, with a positive vision. So a lot of what we do is around positive messaging and trying to, to pull people along and say, hey, look, we can make this really wonderful society. Uh, let's do this together. I see. So, but uh, still, I'm very curious that how, uh, what, how and why did you become interested in water? Because it's, you know, people may not be in, interested in water so much in general. So people is, uh, water is cheap and uh, nothing special and sober. So I'm very much curious how you're so much engaged in the uh, water and environment. For me, one of the big um, aha moments was actually after the uh, 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. Oh, 10 years moment. ago. Yeah, exactly 10 years ago. I mean, we uh, recently commemorated the 10th anniversary, but um, I remember I, I was up in uh, Miyagi and Iwate and Fukushima after the, the, uh, the earthquake and water wasn't available in many places for a long time. So oh. the local governments had to um, bring in the, the water in the, in the trucks, the um, water trucks, and, and it was a really big struggle. But so that was the first time I thought, well, even Japan, such a, an industrialized economic giant can have significant problems with water for a prolonged time. Um, and so that was what made me think, well, you know, what else can we do with water? What other challenges are there? Um, and that slowly led me down to this, this road where I am now. I see. I think that from your CV, so you walked around all over Japan after that, did you? Uh, I uh, walked for about uh, 600 kilometers down the coastline of Tohoku after the ah. tsunami. Um, and that was actually to, to document the recovery of the region um, many years after the, the Fukushima nuclear crisis and the tsunami. Um, so it was about um, documenting, but also about telling the world what's happening uh, in Tohoku uh, many years after the earthquake. So, so it was not right after the earthquake, but the several years later? Exactly, yeah, it was about uh, six years later. Six years later, but still that, you know, uh, not all the regions were recovered and rebuilt. Well, exactly, yeah. The, the, uh, the recovery was still very much ongoing. Um, mm -hmm. There were still buildings that were left as they were. Um, there were many memorials and so on that, that, um, that remained there. So it was still a very, you know, it, time had passed, but time hadn't really passed in many ways. Mm. Yeah. Could you have an opportunity to talk with the local people? You know, what's funny is that when you're walking and you're very sweaty and you have a big bag <laughs> and a camera and everything, many people come and talk to you. What, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> and actually speaking about water, many people offered me water, many, many, wow. many people, because it was really hot. And uh, that's actually, that's another thing that I would say um, about not just the walk, but also with my Mizu is that water is actually a fantastic connector of people. So right now, um, you know, using my Mizu, you can go to a cafe or a shop or restaurant that is part of our network. And that becomes a new point for a conversation and that becomes an entirely new experience. So uh, not just with the walk, but also just generally through my Mizu, we connect people through uh, the, the medium that is water. I see. 
Well, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking that the, what was the most impressive conversation you had with the local people after several years later of the Fukushima earthquake, but still not fully recovered? What was your in, most impressive conversation you could have with the locals? Um, honestly, I mean, there were so many uh, conversations, but just to, to um, reflect upon one specific one, um, I actually, I ended up staying in the home of an elderly, um, elderly woman and her sister. They, they saw me and they're like, oh, please come, come for dinner. And then I ended up just sleeping on the floor. <laughs> it was wow. quite wonderful. Um, but they were telling me about, uh, they had lost their, one of their daughters during the tsunami. Um, and it was a very um, extremely sad story. But what she said was that because of the tsunami, even though terrible things had happened, um, many people from around the world had come to her town in the middle of nowhere, right? Very rural area of Japan. And she was saying that that actually led to so many more uh, conversations and meetings with people that she would never have had. Um, so in a way, it's kind of, she, she saw me and thought, okay, well, let's have a conversation. I want to bring you in because during the time of disaster, people came from all over the world to help us. And that was a very kind of uh, touching uh, moment. Oh, very touchy. Yeah, I moved. Yeah. Okay, that at that time that the Fukushima earthquake was a big issue, but now that we are under pressure of the COVID-19. Yeah. And uh, you know, for example, that I'm involved in a research project called Future Earth that mm -hmm. is a transdisciplinary approach to solve the real issue of the world mm -hmm. from the academic point of view. But then it has had a survey of the what kind of topic is relevant to very immediate pressing topic we should challenge. And uh, five years ago, of course, a lot of talks about that the how to deal with the nuclear power accident or the tsunami uh, disaster. However, I would imagine if we'll do the survey again, maybe the pandemic could be the highest yeah. priority. But how do you think that the uh, COVID-19 affected water and uh, plastic consumptions? Specifically, specifically around uh, plastic bottles, um, I would say that generally there's more fear around transmission of the virus. So for example, we have these water stations in many places, and yet uh, people are perhaps less willing to use them because of the risk of virus transmission. Uh, not only that, but we've, we've generally seen, I believe, uh, an increase in the amount of single-use plastic that's being used, like the masks, gloves, uh, and so on. So from a plastic perspective, I think um, it's been quite a, a negative impact. Um, but I think people are becoming increasingly aware of these issues as well. So these two things are happening, I, I believe. But what about yourself, uh, Taikan? I'd, I'd be very curious to see how, how do you think the, the pandemic is, is affecting the world of water? Uh, well, you know that teleworking or the remote work become very common. And so that may, maybe I'll stay at home for a few days more than the before, so that the my water consumption of my household increased by the like a five cubic meter per month or six cubic meter per month. So that's the, you know, but the that increase it should be compensated by the water consumption in my office. Okay. Either United Nations University or the University of Tokyo. So I'm not sure that the what maybe that we have more we we wash our hands more than before. Mm. Even though that sometimes we do not use water to sanitize our hands, just use alcohol or the I don't know what 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 that pushing one. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> alcohol or sanitizer. Yeah, we uh, use a lot of that stuff <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and uh, but but I I hope that people may have more attention to the water. They need to wash their hands. Sometimes they wash, need to wash uh, their faces to prevent the infections. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also they are gurgling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. 
So how does water affect social and environmental issues? Hmm. What, how do you think that the water, comparing water, water issue within uh, a lot of the environmental issues, water, biodiversity, or the air pollution, or the water quality, uh, water is water quality is water about the forest, the conserving forest. So what is the specific characteristics of water compared to the other environmental issues? That's, that's very, uh... That's a very interesting. I, for me, I think water is, is an extremely uh, cross-cutting issue. It, it affects everything in terms of sustainable development from gender to education to everything in between. Um, before my MISA, actually, I, I was working uh, in international development um, and I spent some time, for example, in Haiti after a major typhoon. Um, and one thing that I remember is that Many of these schools were um, impacted by the, the hurricane. And so lots of kids couldn't go to school. Um, and when people started to rebuild the schools, um, there was a lot of um, surprise as to the, the uh, reduced rate of attendance of young people in the communities. And it turned out that the reason wasn't infrastructural. We didn't need, you know, it wasn't necessarily about building schools. It was actually about the water supply because the water supply had been disrupted in the community, the kids had to walk two or three more hours down the road to get the water and then come back. And by that time, they couldn't really attend school anymore, right? And so that was a very concrete moment where I realized that actually, you know, water is so um, deeply related to education and to so many other issues that, that we face today uh, in society. Yeah, you're right. That I think that is the reason why, so that the least developing nation become developing nation. I mean, about mm -hmm. level up, they invest a lot for that uh, supplying water, and maybe that after following that the sewer uh, mm -hmm. networks to to I mean, uh, 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 keep that water clean. So I think that the all the politicians and the government are aware about the importance of the water. Mm. However, they need some support to invest in the water infrastructure structures. So, okay. And, uh, okay, we have still a little bit of time. So valuing water, I think that is the, uh, the topic of this year, uh, this year's World Water Days uh, report or that World Water Developing Report that is published today from the UN Water. The topic is valuing water. So what is the value of water for you? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> the water, uh, the value of, of water for me is that, um, I mean, it's, it's essential to, to everything that we do. And I think in Japan, especially, we are so unbelievably lucky. You know, we, there is the, the Hyakumesu, for example, in Japan, the 100 oh. famous water points, right? We we're, we're live in one of the countries that has some of the highest quality um, of water in the world. And yet, as you say, we don't really value um, water in a true sense. Um, so for me, I think water is, is absolutely essential to everything, but it also is the key to shifting people's behavior on an everyday basis, because every day we drink water. So if we can start to make small changes from water, then I think we can see a huge impact um, going forward. So that's what water means to me. Uh, but I'd be very curious to know what what does uh, water mean to you? Uh, well, before before I'm answering to your question, that the, you said that you know best water in the world. Yeah. Uh, but but that is the uh, sentiment all over the human beings has. <laughs> water is a local resource. Yeah. Because that's very inexpensive, mm -hmm. so very cheap. So that transport of water doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. 
so that the water, we have to use the water wherever available through the gravity transportation, not by pumping or the tankers. These are very exceptional. If you bring the water through trucks, you cannot bathe with it. Mm -hmm. So that the water, so therefore that the, we are very much uh, I stick to our own water. So we do we dislike that our water will be used by others. Mm. Okay. So that is our sentiment. Actually, that the you know, I'm I'm an uh, engineer and engineer, sort of. <laughs> but the uh, and uh, you know that we deal with that water as the media which brings the quality and heat and mass. And we solve the equations to predict the movement of water. Mm. However, at the same time, I really think that the people's emotion are very important to solve their water issues in mm. society. So that is the most, I mean, exciting and interesting uh, aspect of water as a researcher in the field of water. Very interesting. Can I ask, uh, Taikan, in terms of uh, your background, was there a moment in your life or your career where you realized, okay, water, I'm going to really dive into this subject of water? Well, no, there, there's, there's no uh, very beautiful story about that. Okay. I wanted to go to that, the traffic engineering really yes the reason is you know to design the better traffic system yeah at that time the professor said okay we have to understand the behavior of the human beings and they say that okay we will find that the newton's law of the human's behavior let's wow. do it together that was so fascinating however there were the you know us uh, i mean that a uh, designated number of the students who can go enter to that research group. And there was a uh, stone, scissors, and paper, and I lost it. Oh, no. I'm, really? I'm serious. Really? So, yes. so it was that moment in your life that you could have been doing something completely different. Yeah, you're right. Wow. How about you? <laughs> um, Wow, I can't really beat that story, but, but uh, <laughs> in terms of, of my Mizu, there is, just, there is one moment that, that really um, started things. Um, and that was uh, in 2018, uh, in around April, I had just quit my job. I was okay. very, you know, mentally uh, free and, and, you know, thinking about many things. And I went for a walk along, the, uh, along a beach in Okinawa. Oh. I love, I really love Okinawa. And actually uh, one morning we, I just discovered a whole pile of, of plastic waste uh, along with my, my co-founder. Um, and among the plastic waste, there was fishing gear, there was sandals, there's all kinds of stuff. But the number one thing was actually bottles and lots and lots of water bottles. And, and it just struck me that we live in such a, a, a fortunate country in that we, we can just open up the tap and we have you know, extremely high quality water. And yet we, this is the result of, of our behavior. So that was one moment, but there was no um, rock, paper, scissors <laughs> in that story. <laughs> okay, great. So it's time to answer the question we got. More okay. than a dozen of questions we got. Yep. Okay, let's do it from the top. So that the, from uh, Priyanka Borpoyaris, Okay, I'm a foreigner living in Japan, and, and I found it very surprising to see the near absence of drinking water facilities in Japan, and people are used to buying water. Japan attempts to help poor countries, but there is a complete lack of recognition of water as a human right with institutions in Japan. What would it take to change that? This. Is that for me or? Maybe for know. you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This is a, a great point. I think, um, you know, one of the challenges, as you say, is that the access to, to water is a human right, but that conversation isn't really had in, in Japan. Um, 
But I, I think it takes creativity. I think it takes conversations like this so that we can begin to understand the true value of water. Um, recently, I think in 2019, there was a, a big typhoon uh, that hit Chiba. And as a result, I believe there was a huge um, disruption to water supply, right? Yeah. And so often it takes this kind of disruption to realize oh, how much we rely on things. Uh, but it shouldn't be like that. We should really be having these conversations more and more often. And that's actually why we're, we're doing uh, my Mizu. It's to increase the awareness around water by having physical um, water stations, as, as Priyanka mentioned, um, and creating more of a, a trigger, a, a conversation point for people to have these kinds of discussions. What do you think, uh, Taikan? Well, well, I think that the still there are a lot of water fountains in Japan. Mm -hmm. However, some parents or that the um, younger generation are a little bit concerned about the, you know, how to say, is it really pure or that mm -hmm. clean about the fountain water or not? So they avoid using these fountains. That could be the one reason yeah. to that the, there are not so many now, but when I was a kid that I, I drank the tap water from directly from tap. So, and about the human rights issue that Japanese government has been refusing to uh, accept that the access to their safe drinking water is a basic human rights mm. because they are very serious. If they admit they have, they have oblig they are obliged to provide the service to everybody. Interesting. Yeah. It, but but in, in reality that the Japanese government has been supporting the, the developing nations and least developing nations mm. to have more access to safe drinking water. So mm. they recognize the importance. However, they do not want to have the uh, obligation to support the people. That's very interesting. That's so that, that, only the interpretation. I'm sorry that the, I'm, 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 I'm not sure that who is listening to the conversation <laughs> series. Okay. <laughs> if I can yeah. just add one point to your, your yeah. first point, um, yes. on about the um, perception of water. You were saying when you were younger, you used to drink from the tap. And, when we first began my Mizu, I remember we did many interviews with people to understand mm -hmm. uh, the perceptions around tap water. And I remember I interviewed one student, like a very mm -hmm. ath athletic, you know, man, uh, male student. And I asked him, uh, you know, do you drink tap water? And he said, uh, no. And I, and I asked him why? And he said, because if I'm seen refilling my bottle at the tap, then I look poor. And, I, and that really struck me because this is a really big challenge of perception, right? So wow. we need to, we need to uh, make it cool to use tap water and to, to uh, use these public facilities. Otherwise, you know, the young people will not follow. So that was a really big learning point for me. So yeah. make it cool. Oh, very good point. Yeah. Yeah. So that, okay. Related to the Maimizu, that yeah. he, does Maimiz have any plans to build out its networks in global South countries where it may be even more impactful and useful, both for locals and visitors? If so, how does MIMIS plan to tackle some of the unique obstacles it may encounter there, such as measuring water quality from individual marked sources and accuracy? Uh oh, I lost. <laughs> Accuracy, something so that we have a global self. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, what I would say is that actually we have a number of partner cafes and restaurants and hotels in global South countries. Um, for example, we have uh, cafes in Kenya. We have um, cafes in, I believe, uh, parts of South America as well. Um, and so what was great is that a lot of these businesses found out about my music somehow I have no idea how and they just signed up so we actually have some existing um, points in global south countries um, what I would say about future strategy is that 
Uh, right now we're focusing on Japan because uh, you know, we're based here and because this is uh, the world's third largest economy. And if we can make an impact here, then we can make a huge impact. So for now, we're focusing on Japan, um, but certainly uh, looking to the future, we're looking at how we can um, engage more strategically with uh, Global South countries. Yeah, I know that, but the, maybe the major point is, okay, in Japan, if we identify that the uh, water tap, free water tap or the fountain, you can provide the information. Yeah. However, if you go to the other countries, sometimes, the water may not be potable yeah. or that the complete 100% safe. Yeah. How do you compromise that the water supply and safety? This is a great point. And, and what I would say is that, for example, we were contacted by some people in the Philippines uh -huh. who uh, th there are these water dispensers uh, around, for example, Manila, I believe. Um, and people often go to buy water from these, these kinds of private uh, locations. So one of our ideas is to actually map out all of these private locations so that people can access water um, without the plastic. Um, this is, again, still very um, early stage, so I, no promises, but there's something we're looking at um, going forward. Well, thank you very much. So next question could be that the, okay, or oh, Danielle from the University of Tokyo, that regarding collaboration acceptance from incumbents that I remember about the Muji water. <laughs> oh, you laughed. So anything <laughs> you can talk. Yeah, he is wondering that whether this one example, since my miss is before, and or there are some partnerships with the companies or organizations or they're just competing each other? Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> okay, um, Muji has a very similar service um, that was launched actually after MyMizu, I believe maybe seven or eight months after. Um, and for me, that's fantastic. You know, if, <laughs> if other companies are doing this, then the, the whole pie gets bigger for everyone. Um, so I see it as, as a win. Um, but that wasn't a collaboration. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that, uh, you know, but I'm very happy for them. <laughs> However, um, in terms of um, corporate collaborations, just for one example, uh, we actually have our own brand of renewable energy for homes and for businesses called My Mizu Denki. And the idea is that you can actually uh, sign your house up to get 100% renewable energy through our partnership with a, an energy company called Shizen Denyoku. So um, we have a number of corporate partnerships that we're, that we're okay. doing. Yeah, great. Oh, we have another interesting question. Okay, that the, uh, having lived for over six years in China, I see government investing into programs like the MIMIS with portable water invest installments all over the city. People always carry their reusable water bottles, beverage companies losing markets. So in China, I, I'm not sure that we city it, it, it is, but the, maybe that in general. So the question is, so what are you doing to get the government and policymakers buy this idea as well? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. And, um, one thing that we're doing is we're working with local governments. So, for example, um, we're working with Kobe City in Japan, which is the uh, sixth largest city uh, in Japan. And the idea is to create more refill friendly cities. So if you go anywhere in Kobe, you can just take your reusable bottle. It can be any bottle. It doesn't have to be a my music bottle. It can be anything. And you can refill at many points around the city. And actually, there are many local governments um, across Japan who are doing similar projects. So in terms of policy at the local level, um, we're directly working with local government to make those things more realistic. Um, in terms of the higher level things, um, for example, uh, my co-founder Mariko is, is part of a, um, a global future council of the World Economic Forum, where they directly input into national level legislation wow. as well. So we are, you know, I'm not the biggest um, policy fan. I, I find it a bit uh, difficult, but we are, you know, we realize it's a, it's a critical part of the puzzle and we, we're trying to do our best there as well. Yeah. 
I feel comfortable to see you are doing that. My means not for you know build up your career, but just for fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah man, I guess so. It's it's a very uh, there are many challenges as well, but uh, you know hopefully it will do some good for the world. Fingers crossed. Great. So we have a question from the South Africa. Nicholas asked that the did you or do you have any challenges when expanding to countries where water is not easily available like Japan, where there is no custom of providing free water? Yes, in Japan, in restaurants that basically the water is free if mm. you buy some food, right? Yeah. But the, that not, you know, the common sense outside Japan. Yeah. So what could be the it could be a big challenge for you. Definitely. But what I would say is there is also a lot of opportunity. opportunity. So when there's always a challenge, there's always opportunity. And okay. uh, for, exa <laughs> for example, uh, in the case of, uh, I believe, Bali in Indonesia, there are many cafes and um, shops that have these water servers that anyone can use. So the tap water is not drinkable, but the cafes and shops provide drinkable water. And you might ask why, right? Why do they provide free water? and they pay for it um, because it's actually a great way of building relations with new customers. It's a great way of building relations with the local community um, and it's relatively low cost. So um, while there are definitely challenges, I also see a lot of um, opportunities on the road ahead. Yeah, I like that play that the, if there is a challenge that can be an opportunity. Very good. Well, yeah, that yeah. take home message maybe. <laughs> But I'm not so good at, you know, I come up with lots of ideas, but I'm terrible at uh, implementing, <laughs> just to yeah. let you know. <laughs> well, that, yeah, everybody has, you know, good advantage and disadvantages. <laughs> okay, another question is that from a student of the Sophia University, and uh, you said that many university high schools and local governments are taking part in the project My Mizu. He wants to, he or she want to know how specific, specifically they join the project. How the schools and universities can join my MISU? For universities, for example, uh, recently we launched a collaboration with Konan Joshidayaku, so uh, Konan Women's University. And uh, what we did was uh, we have a, a new um, challenge called the My Mizu Challenge. And the idea is, you try to uh, refill your water bottle and save plastic bottles as many times as possible for, let's say, one month. Um, and so we actually have a, a lot of students at Kornan Women's University who were taking part in this challenge um, and having this fun competition. So actually, a critical part of what we do as my music is to gamify, make it a fun experience to become more uh, environmentally sustainable. So one thing that we do with universities is this My Misa challenge where we have fun and we engage as many people as possible. Um, a second one, for example, with schools, uh, we do lots of workshops and uh, lots of educational programs with schools. Um, we also do, for example, beach cleans. Uh, we do uh, lots of physically, you know, going to the beach and picking up rubbish and um, having a good time as well. Um, and I recently, I mentioned, we also do like more arty creative things. Uh, so we do these bottle design competitions with students, you know, engaging them in social issues through uh, the power of arts as well. So many different things, but those are just a few of the examples. Okay, so that the that the education narrow institutes are not joining just for the providing that drink uh, supplying water points but the water is the entering point to be engaged in the environmental protection activities, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay, okay, here is then a uh, challenge for you. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. How could you approach potential users who like to drink water without chlorine? I mean, they're not, you know, sanitized or that the, without the, chlorine water because that the bottled water you don't need to mm. add the chlorines and uh, some people doesn't like that smell of the chlorine yeah. so how can you approach to these people 
I, I feel like uh, Taikan san you'd, you'd be a better person to answer this question but maybe <laughs> maybe one thing I can add to this yeah. is um, because we work with many local governments in Japan um, we learn a lot about the public water system um, and so one thing I learned is that for example the public water works actually has 200 um, safety criteria for tap water in certain cities like for example in Kobe city they have 200 criteria to make sure the water is safe and drinkable um, whereas bottled water sometimes only has 50 or even less right and so i mean just rationally i actually think tap water in many cases is more safe and more monitored um, however i would love to hear your opinion because you know okay. 10 times more than i do uh, i don't know that the exact english word but the you know that the there is a very handy cleaner of i mean uh, the water, water treatment hmm. a filter Pamela. Yeah. yeah yeah so that we which can neutralize the chlorine okay maybe that using carbonate to catch that the chlorine and uh, you can have that the, with the smell of chlorine so i think that the, yeah you can have a tumbler that's a very very practical step on on world war today <laughs> yes <laughs> no uh, yeah that the, these you know puri, puri, purifier mm. the engine uh ordinary that they put at the top yeah and the pure uh clean it but the very the handy one you can use and mm -hmm. without the energy just you know while you are bringing chop 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 and it neutralize that cold line so mm -hmm. that may work for you okay uh we still have more time uh well okay do you think Okay, uh, do you think that Japanese people have less attention for the environmental issues, including the, including the problem of water than other developed countries? Do you have Japanese should have moral awareness of them uh, from Watanabe-san? Uh, Taika-san, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I have been living in Japan for, through, for my life, so, well, that's not exactly true about the uh, that depends on who asks you to whom who you ask so sometimes some people in japan very much keen on the environmental issues mm. however that the, sometimes they are not but let's see for example that the garbage on the street is much less than mm. most of other nations don't you think so robin Definitely, yeah, especially yeah. in the major urban areas. Yeah, major urban areas, except for the beach you found, then you, you, which took you to that water world. But the, yeah, I think that the, my, yeah, through the communication from overseas researchers, my colleagues, that in Europe, they are more, how to say, uh, fundamentalist on the environment. So if they find something is not good for environment, they just stop it. Mm. In particular in Germany. Interesting. <laughs> good or bad. I don't believe French. They... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure about the Italians, but the yeah in German that the yeah they they are very theoretical. So that from the ascent, if there is some scientific evidence, okay, that plastic bottle is really bad for environment, they stop it or they make it re reusable, returnable. And actually that, have you ever seen that recycling bottle of, not recycling, I mean the reuse, reusing mm. that the pet bottles, not glass bottle, pet bottles are just washed and use it again. Really? In yes. Germany? In Germany. Wow. So in Japan, maybe that's the people may have some mental barrier. Okay, mm, shall we use it again or not? And mm. you know that the reused pet bottles are not as fresh as what mm. we see in Japan. There may be some slacks on it, 
and not hundred percent, you know, shining. However, mm. they just use it because they believe that is better for environment. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I think that in some ways people in Japan are extremely environmentally aware. Um, if you look at how uh, little waste there is, and sometimes in households, you know, people are very uh, aware of motainai and this kind of culture. Um, but specifically regarding certain things like um, like plastic waste, I think the public awareness is generally, um, you know, maybe not as advanced as other countries. Um, but what I would say is that there's a lot of change happening. And, and I think because through my work, you know, one of the reasons I love what I do is that I get to speak to a lot of um, high school students, university students, um, and the level of interest among the Generation Z and the millennials uh, generation is extremely high. Um, so, you know, I see things are changing very rapidly. Uh, so in the next maybe two, three, four, five years, I think we'll see a really accelerated awareness of not just plastic waste, but renewable energy and all kinds of other issues, including water, I hope. Okay. So here is a proposal, not challenge. I think it would help if the establishment that proposed top water would arbor the Miami's symbol. So this will help the, for example, mothers who, oh, a uh, mother who are on the run with young children and who don't have the time to pull out the mo their mobile phone to open the my admins app. So actually this person experienced this the other day where see or he was uh, desperately in need of a bottle of water refill and was in front of a few restaurants wondering which one to go into. This would also increase visibility for my mizu. Thank you. Some stickers. <laughs> I'm taking notes. No, I, we actually have, um, we have stickers that go in the front of shops and cafes and restaurants who are part of the network for exactly- Why don't you issues. have tonight for your background? <laughs> this is a big uh, lesson for me. I should have had some massive- uh, Yeah, you should actually, have. I, I have a t-shirt. This is why I'm wearing a t-shirt. Oh, feel, is that my Miz t-shirts? Yeah, but I feel very underdressed now, but just to justify, you know, this oh, t-shirt. Yeah, it's that's a good Miz. excuse. <laughs> 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 but no, um, and, and Catherine, I, I appreciate uh, your idea. And, and we're actually trying to install more of the visibility around um, the refill points. Um, just one example is if you go to any IKEA in Japan, the furniture store, they actually have um, Maimizu branding on some of their water fountains. So again, it's a similar idea of um, raising visibility. But thank you for the feedback. Yeah, thank you very much. So that the could be the final question. So the person totally agree with Robin Lewis, you in Japan amongst adults, we need to find ways to make sure that bottled waters with tap water is cool. Mm. How can Japan make this happen? How does my miss make this happen? This is really a challenge around communication design. And mm -hmm. that's why actually, probably 80% of my time is spent doing um, communications, messaging campaigns, because ultimately it's about creating a new culture. It's about creating a new perception around water. Um, so that's why actually we do a lot of um, creative events, for example, um, with schools and with universities, we do beach cleans because if you spend some time on the beach digging through you know, rubbish, uh, you, you have some uh, new learnings. Um, we also um, leverage the power of um, media and also so, like culture as well. We have what we call Maimizu ambassadors who are um, athletes, who are artists. Um, recently, we welcomed a Paralympic um, sports person into our team of uh, ambassadors. So the idea is to really create a new conversation around um, not just water, but also sustainability issues through more of a positive a conversation and positive messaging so yeah it's a lot of it is around storytelling uh, and i think it's to do a lot with building a new culture through engaging people and so on so for more information um and catherine if you'd like to see our social media for example we have lots of um kind of positive and, and somewhat creative messaging around sustainability and a lot of what we do is around that thank you very much actually the 
I was reminded that the when that the, you know big petal bottle of water came into Japan, mm. it was cool to really? drink the pet yeah bottle of water. Yes, and I remember that there was some you know strap to hold that two yeah. bottle of water in front of you by really? the Gucci or Chanel or the, these big brands. Wow. Yeah, so that at that time, okay, I'm drinking the bottle of the water. I mean, a plastic bottle of water. That was cool. Now you're trying to change it. But you know what's really interesting about that is, is uh, beverage company, uh, a lot of companies have put a lot of money into marketing bottled yeah. water, right? And for every bottle, I mean, I always carry a plastic bottle just for these occasions, but you know, the, the water footprint of this water bottle is at least two times the actual amount of water in this bottle. So we're using so many resources, including uh, water to create these, right? Um, but what's really fascinating is companies are using a lot of resources to you know, have this uh, really beautiful perception of water, as, as you mentioned, uh, Taikan san. And what we're trying to do is kind of counter that. But we're a tiny four, we're a tiny group of people trying to do this counter balance, right? And that's why we rely so much on partnerships with the schools and universities and companies, because, you know, this is a battle that we all have to take part in and, and we'll all benefit from. So um, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but I, I love challenges. So every day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That maybe that we can go to this final question. What do you think the nation's government at all levels, NGOs could do to spread water awareness through case studies of water success, failure, and uh, accountability? I'm thinking locally of the Flint, Michigan water crisis and the race and uh, class implication of water access in the U.S but wonder about international resources to learn about best and worst practices in a variety of countries. So it's a Meg uh, Prude University Northwest. So maybe I should answer this. And yes, uh, please please uh, look up the UN Water. Uh, UN Water is that the consortium of the, the more than 20 UN organizations join together and uh, every year we publish that uh, World Water Development Report. And within it, you will find a lot of case studies, not about you know, global macro scale statistics, how many people in the world has no access to safe drinking water, but okay, in the city of the somewhere, so it happened or that in, or the bad examples or the success, how that the, uh, water governance may, may, could be changed and have better services was available. So that the, yeah, I think the UN is trying to collect and support that the each local municipalities to do the better way of the water governance. So thank you very much for the question. And I think that unfortunately we are losing time, but Robin, do you want to say something as uh, the final comment for this tonight conversation series. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much to, to you and, and the UNU team for, for having me. Um, and secondly, I mean, just one final thought from myself. Uh, as I mentioned before, we use water the first thing in the morning, we use water right before we go to bed. Um, every day we're using so much water, but we don't really think about it. So. I guess my, my call for action would be uh, think about the water that you're using, not just today, um, but every day. Um, and also think about where it comes from because that can have quite a big impact on the way that you see the world. So it doesn't just come from the tap, it comes from the lake, the reservoir, and maybe having this kind of awareness can even in a small way um, change your behavior and make you want to engage more in, in these issues. So. Um, I would just say thank you again for having me and um, happy World Water Day. Thank you very much. Happy World Water Day. So thank you very much for the audience and thank you, Robin. So have a, yes, enjoy your water. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Good night.